Okay, so our next talk is by John Morgan, as you can see in the Poincaré Conjecture, 1905-2002. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here to help examine the effect of Poincaré's work for the 100 years following his life. Like most, if not all, topologists, I consider Poincaré the founder of the subject of topology. There, of course, had been topological work before Poincaré. Uh, Euler, for example, or uh, Betty. But the first time topology became a subject in its own right was, as far as I'm concerned, in the work of Poincaré. Now, I'm not going to try to give a general discussion of all of Poincaré's uh, topological work. I'm going to concentrate on one very famous but small piece of his work, the Poincaré conjecture. And I believe Dave Gabay later in this conference will talk more about Poincaré's topological work. So the story really begins with work in the latter part of the last half of the 19th century on surfaces. They were, by the time Poincaré started his work on higher dimensional spaces, very well understood. And in the 1890s, Poincaré began a long study of higher dimensional spaces. And as I said, he introduced many of the techniques and ideas that still today form the basis of the subject of topology. And this work really culminated in 1905 in the uh, cinquième complément de analysis situs, where he formulated a question, which later became known as the Poincaré conjecture. He believed this was a central question in the theory of topology, and it concerned the first dimension in which things were not understood at that time. Everything was understood for curves and surfaces, but not for three-dimensional spaces. And it also concerned what Poincaré considered, many considered the simplest of all three-dimensional spaces, the three-dimensional sphere. And he asked a topological question about that simplest case in the next dimension. And that's the Poincaré conjecture. And through my talk, I will formulate the conjecture for you if you don't know the statement. So as I said, Poincaré thought he was asking the next question, the next one that you should look at in order to make uh, progress in the subject. The first dimension that we didn't understand, so we move up by dimension. They'll just get more and more complicated as we go up. So we're in the next dimension, dimension three and we'll look at the simplest of all three-dimensional spaces. Well, he was wrong. He was wrong on both accounts. Turned out that his question was generalized in many ways to other three-dimensional spaces and to higher-dimensional spaces. And this question, rather than being the next one to be resolved, was the final one to be resolved. So much was learned about higher dimensional spaces before we understood Poincaré's question. And much was understood about other seemingly more complicated, larger three-dimensional spaces than about the simplest of all three-dimensional spaces, the sphere. So it took mathematicians almost 100 years, 1905, when the question was formulated to 2002 before this particular question was solved. But in trying to understand this question and analogs in higher dimensions and for other three-dimensional spaces, 100 years of topology developed and grew out of these studies. And from my own somewhat biased perspective, I think of the 20th century as the century of topology. And it's due in great measure to trying to understand question that Poincaré asked and its various generalizations using many of the techniques that he laid down. By the way, the answer to his question is yes. 
Frank Ray posed the question, and I will, I will show you the, uh, the way he formulated it, um, in purely topological terms. He has surfaces and curves on surfaces and the way they intersect each other. And out of all of that, you can formulate the question. I think he clearly had in mind this was how you would solve the question. But in fact, once again, his intuition was not correct, if this is indeed what his intuition was, because the solution came from a completely different part of mathematics. Maybe most surprising of all, that part of mathematics is closely related to other parts of Poincaré's work, namely his work on Fuchsian and more particularly on Kleinian groups. So let's go back and put ourselves at the turn of the century or maybe the 1890s and discuss briefly what was understood about surfaces. So first of all, maybe I should tell you what I mean by a surface. So these surfaces are going to be non-singular. It's possible to think about singular spaces. They're more complicated. We're going to concentrate today on manifolds or non-singular spaces. So the defining property of a surface is really the one I've shown you here, that every point on the surface has a neighborhood, which looks topologically just like an open ball in the plane. And surface, or two-dimensional space, is reflected in the fact that our model is the plane, which is two-dimensional, meaning that locally we have two coordinates. And you see I've drawn the coordinate lines there. So that's the defining property of a surface. Um, for technical reasons, we're going to think of only compact surfaces. The topologists or the mathematicians in the audience will be very familiar with this. For those of you who are not, Compact simply means the surface in question is a finite extent, and there are no missing points or edges that you can fall off of. Well, there's a topological classification of these compact surfaces. I've drawn here some of the first few. These are all two-sided surfaces, or the technical term is orientable. They're classified by one integer, the genus which starts at 0, 1's the torus we were just hearing about, genus 2, 3, 4. And you can imagine how this series continues. You simply put in more and more poles. And the topological classification of these orientable surfaces is that every or compact orientable surface is topologically equivalent to one of these. And in fact, depending on how the surface is presented to you, they're fairly effective ways of deciding where on the list your surface sits. Now, I haven't talked about non-orientable surfaces, but there's a similar <coughs> classification for those. So that, in fact, we have a complete classification of all uh, compact surfaces. I'm not going to talk too much about non-orientable surfaces, but I can't resist showing you a couple of them. These, unlike the orientable surfaces, which we have nice representations of in two-dimensional space. They sit embedded in two-dimensional space. Non-orientable ones don't, so we have no direct picture of them. This is a picture of the, the smallest non-orientable surface, the projective plane. And you can see it's a three-dimensional representation, but there's a place where the surface crosses itself right here. So it's not actually an embedded representation of the surface. Another one very famous. The Klein bottle, uh, once again, you see this surface cutting itself right here, and that's not part of the, in the definition of the surface, these two sheets are separate. So this is not an embedding. The surface crosses itself. And this is the beginning of, these are the first two in the list of non-orientable surfaces. The list goes on analogous to the way it does for orientable surfaces. All right. Well, one question I haven't addressed uh, at all, and which is somewhat delicate to talk about, is when are we going to consider two spaces as equivalent? Well, the answer, of course, depends on which kind of mathematics you're doing, what kind of structures you're interested in concentrating on. And here, we're concentrating on topology only. So two spaces are the same. 
if there's a continuous mapping from one to the other that's a bijection and doesn't do any tearing or ripping of the topological structure, that has to be true of the mapping and its inverse at the topological equivalence. So in particular in topology, there's no notion of lengths of curves, area, volume, shape, or size. There's only the form that you have. A round sphere, an ellipse, a very wobbly thing like the surface of the Earth, those are all topologically equivalent. They're the two sphere. We have the nice round torus that we think about, but we can have a very elongated one, a very long, thin one. Those are all topologically equivalent equivalent. Often one thinks of topology in, as the science of cut and paste. You present a topological space by giving various pieces and saying how they fit together. The pieces can be quite simple, but if there are enough of them and the gluing pattern is complicated enough, you can get quite interesting shapes, topological spaces, out of fairly simple pieces. And I want to show you a couple of uh, examples in surfaces where we can really see what's going on before we get to our higher dimensional spaces. So I'm going to give you a cut and paste description of the two sphere. There it is. There's the two sphere. I think of it as the join of the upper and lower hemisphere with the two boundary circles glued together becoming the equator. So just to uh, separate the pieces a little bit, I'll put the, the two hemispheres, I'll separate them. Again, their boundaries are to be identified together. Now I'll flatten out each of the hemispheres, and I can think of the two sphere as two disks. It's two disks with their boundaries glued together, going around here is identified with going around there. So that's a cut and paste description of the two sphere. Just so you get a little more sense, I'll do a cut and paste description of the two torus, a very famous one. We start with the square, and we're going to identify the top with the bottom, as indicated here, and the right side with the left side. So let's just see what happens when we do that. Well, if I identify the top and bottom together, I get a cylinder, and now on the cylinder, I need to identify the right-hand circle and the left-hand circle together, and that's not too hard to do bend this tube around until its ends are close to each other, and then glue them together, and you see you get the torus. So this is a cut and paste description of the torus. Let me give you a cut and paste description of this projective plane, and I'll start with the description of the projective plane as the space of straight lines in three-dimensional space that pass through the origin. Well, any straight line that passes through the origin meets the sphere, the unit sphere, in two antipodal points. So the real projective plane is the space you obtain, topological space you obtain, by taking the two sphere and identifying antipodal points. Well, you can't actually see that space, but every antipode has one representative in the upper hemisphere and one representative in the lower hemisphere with some exceptions. The exceptions are points on the equator where both the point and its antipode are on the equator. So the space of lines in three-dimensional space can be identified with the upper hemisphere with a gluing identification or a gluing rule that says you take every point on the boundary and glue it to its antipode. Well, here I've flattened out the upper hemisphere to a disk. And now this antipodal identification identifies the lower half circle with the upper half circle. Now, again, you can't really see that space, but there's another nice description of it. A neighborhood of what's happening out here on the boundary, in fact, is the Mobius band. And then the inside is just a nice disk. So the projective plane is the union of the Mobius band with the disk where the boundaries are glued together. Okay. So that's some cut and paste topology in dimension two. Now we're ready to move to higher dimensions. And unusual to our eyes and ears, 
Poincaré started his treatise on high dimensional spaces by defending the right to do this study. So he said that, paraphrasing from the French to the English, even though we cannot directly see these higher dimensional spaces, they are susceptible to mathematical definition and is thus subject to rigorous mathematical study. And furthermore, his studies in other areas of mathematics and physics always led him back to these questions about the topology of higher dimensional spaces. So for those reasons, he proposed to make a study of higher dimensional spaces, which he started with these treatises. OK, well, I want to concentrate, as I said, on three-dimensional spaces. So their defining property is the analogous property to surfaces, but now using three coordinates instead of two. So spaces that are locally modeled on ordinary three-dimensional Euclidean space. In other words, near every point, we have three local coordinates, which look like the coordinates in Euclidean space. And again, I'm going to only consider the compact case. No missing points, no edges, and uh, a finite extent. As I said, we cannot, as Poincaré said, we cannot directly see any of the spaces. But let's think about the simplest one, the one that the Poincaré conjecture concerns. And that's the sphere, the three-dimensional sphere. So the three-dimensional sphere is given inside four-dimensional Euclidean space, the Euclidean space of four coordinates, by a single equation, the analog of the equation for the unit sphere in three space. Okay. So this is a three-dimensional sphere. How are we going to understand the three-dimensional sphere? I'm going to give you two descriptions, and both of them are by analogy with what we've already, well, with uh, things that are easy to see about the two-sphere. So the first is, think of the three-dimensional sphere as a completion of ordinary three-dimensional space where we add one more point. And again, if we drop down a dimension to dimension two, this is something that you can see through what's known as stereographic projection. Imagine a uh, a light at the north pole of the sphere, and we have a plane which is tangent to the opposite south pole. The light rays coming out of here, straight lines from this point, will puncture the sphere in one point and continue down onto the plane. So this gives us a correspondence between all the points in the sphere and all the points on the plane, with one exception. There's no point in the plane that corresponds to the North Pole. So if you take the North Pole out of the two-sphere, this straight line identification between points in the sphere and points in the plane identifies all of the two-sphere except the North Pole with the plane. I think of this as, um, I guess you have these in France, these balls of cheese. And at uh, Christmas time, they're wrapped up in paper and then tied up with a nice little bow. Well, this time our paper is not of finite extent. It's of infinite extent. And there's nothing left over when we wrap it up. As you go out to infinity in any direction on the paper, you're headed, if you go out by a straight line, you're headed along a geodesic toward the North Pole. So that's one description of the two-sphere. There's a completely analogous description of the three-dimensional sphere. It is the completion of ordinary three-dimensional space by adding one more point at infinity. And if you start here and you go out in any direction toward infinity, you're headed toward that last point. And so that's one way to think about the three-sphere. There's a cut and paste description of the three-sphere, which is analogous to the cut and paste description I gave you of the two-sphere. Namely, the two-sphere was a union of two disks glued together along their boundary. So the three-sphere is the union of two solid three-dimensional balls glued together along their boundary. You can sort of almost imagine how you're going to do this. You start gluing the boundaries together, but it doesn't quite work at the end. We can't see this three-dimensional sphere. Nevertheless, we have a nice mathematical description of it. 
Now, it, it turns out that every three-dimensional manifold has a description similar to the one that I just gave of the sphere, where you have to replace the ball by what's called a solid handle body. So here I have two solid handle bodies of genus three. So this time, the, the boundary, which is what you see here, is one of these surfaces, the surface of genus three, but I'm now considering the region of three-dimensional space enclosed by this surface. So just like the balls were the regions enclosed by the spheres, here I'm talking about the, what are called solid handle bodies are the regions enclosed by these surfaces. So if I take these two solid handle bodies, their boundaries are topologically equivalent. In fact, there are lots of topological equivalences between them, some very interesting ones. You take any topological equivalence from one boundary to the other and you glue them together, you'll get a three-dimensional manifold and every orientable three-dimensional manifold can be presented that way for some genus handle body. The sphere was made by using genus zero handle bodies, those with boundary of sphere, the two spheres. The three sphere is the only three manifold that can be presented that way, but every three manifold can be presented using some handle body of higher genus. Well, the trouble with this description is that there are many different ways, in equivalent ways, of presenting the same manifold. So you can have lots and lots of different handle body decompositions. A presentation of a manifold is a union of two solid handle bodies by some gluing, where the genus of the handle bodies are different, the gluings are completely different, yet the manifolds are the same. There is a sequence of elementary moves that allows you to go from any one presentation to the other, but one of the moves allows increasing the genus of the handle body. So in fact, there's no effective algorithm for deciding when two um, handle body presentations give the same manifold. Okay. So that's a way to present all three-dimensional manifolds, and in some theoretical sense, at least, element, well, in a result that tells you elementary moves that will carry you from any one presentation to any other of the three-dimensional <laughs> manifolds. But we need to work on the other side as well. How can we tell when two spaces really are different? And of course, the answer to that is invariance, tautological. Two manifolds have different invariants. Well, if two manifolds have different invariants, they're different. There are lists of invariants for manifolds, many of them introduced by Poincaré, and we'll concentrate on one. But there's no general theorem that tells you when you have enough invariants. And in fact, the Poincaré conjecture is a question about whether or not a particular invariant is enough to distinguish the three sphere from all others. So as I said, Poincaré introduced many invariants, which I won't talk about. I'll just list them. The homology, well, homology was, parts of homology were known before Poincaré, but Poincaré focused on homology. He introduced a group that will be very important for us. It's called the fundamental group or the groupe de Poincaré. And that group is made from loops in the space. And in the case of three-dimensional manifolds, that group can actually be computed from the presentation of the manifold as a union of two handle bodies. So let's just talk for a few minutes about loops in the space. And let's go back to the case of surfaces. Uh, here I've drawn three surfaces. The surfaces are indicated in red. And on each surface, well, on the sphere, I have a loop. On the torus, I have a loop. And on the sphere of genus two, I have three loops. Now, it's not too hard to convince yourself that this loop on the two-sphere actually can be continuously deformed to a point. In fact, as you see it here, it bounds a, a disk on the surface of the sphere, topological disk, and you can use that disk to shrink the curve down. 
it's probably also fairly intuitively obvious that this loop on the torus cannot be shrunk to a point continuously. No matter how I try to move this loop around, keeping it on the surface of the torus, it's going to go around this hole so I can never shrink it to a point. And here I've drawn three loops on this surface. There are many, many more. I've cho chosen to draw these three, which can't be shrunk to points. Now, I've given, I gave you a brief argument that this loop on the surface of the sphere can be shrunk to a point. In fact, any loop on the surface of the sphere can be shrunk to a point. If you think of the sphere as two-dimensional space with one more point, as long as the loop avoids the extra point, it's a loop in the plane, and any loop in the plane, we can just take a straight line shrinking down to the origin. So that works to show that any loop on the two-sphere shrinks to a point, but on every other surface, as I've indicated the next two here, there are loops that don't shrink to points. So the two-sphere is characterized by a topological property among all surfaces. It's the only surface with the property that every loop on it shrinks to a point. Well, surfaces and more generally spaces with this property are called simply connected. So the two-sphere is the only simply connected surface. Okay, so Poincaré said, what about dimension three? Is the three-sphere the only three-dimensional manifold with the property that every loop deforms continuously to a trivial or point loop. That's the Poincaré conjecture. And it's in complete analogy with what happens in dimension two. So said another way, if a three-manifold M is simply connected, then is M topologically equivalent to the sphere or topologically equivalent to the union of three balls with their boundaries identified? That's the Poincaré conjecture. Poincaré presented three-dimensional manifolds in exactly the way I have talked about them in terms of the unions of two solid handle bodies. And he gave some very beautiful examples of surfaces that were presented this way in explicit equivalences of boundaries of handle bodies. Um, there was an earlier version of his question in which he asked whether or not the homology was enough to, de to determine this three to characterize the three-sphere. Was the three-sphere the only three-dimensional manifold with its homology? And then he gave an example of a union of two genus two handle bodies, an explicit example. And he computed the first homology and showed it was zero, and computed the fundamental group, or Poincaré's group, and showed that it was not trivial, showing that this manifold was in fact not topologically equivalent to the three-sphere, even though it had the same homology. Uh, that manifold now goes under the name of Poincaré's homology sphere. So his first attempt at this question turned out not to be correct, and he gave the counterexample, and then he formulated it this way. So as I said earlier, it doesn't stretch the imagination to believe he thought the question could be answered by studying these handle bodies and the way they're glued together, in particular looking at various uh, closed curves on the boundaries, boundary surface that describes the two, the handle bodies on the two sides. So I think he, reading now, it seems like he thought it should be possible to study those presentations and the various moves and prove his answer his question. Well, not only did he believe that, but generation after generation of leading topologists over the next almost 100 years believed that enough to attempt to answer the question in these terms, and it all came to naught, at least as far as the Poincaré conjecture was concerned. Now, it didn't lead to naught, it just led to naught in resolving this conjecture. It's through these attempts that much was learned about other three-dimensional manifolds, more complicated three-dimensional manifolds in the 1950s and 1960s. 
And also in higher dimensions. There's an analog of Poincaré's conjecture about spheres in higher dimensions. And in 1961, Smale resolved it and showed that the analog of Poincaré's question was, in fact, true in all dimensions, five and higher. And then in the early 80s, Mike Friedman resolved the analogous question in dimension four, leaving only the original question in dimension three about spheres. And also, as I, I said, for three-dimensional spaces, three-dimensional manifolds, much more complicated manifolds were fairly well understood by this time as well. So we have the two axes, dimension going up and complication going out. We have the three sphere down here in the corner, and we have all this information going up and all this information going out, and this question left standing as the last, last man standing. Well, it was finally solved. Poincaré's question was resolved in 2002. Uh, by Grigory Perlman. He showed that the Poincaré conjecture is true, is true. That is to say, the answer to Poincaré's question is yes. If you have a simply connected three-dimensional manifold, it is topologically equivalent to the three-sphere. But the method of solution, unlike the previous 100 years of it, 97 years of attack, was not a purely topological attack. The solution came from very different areas of mathematics, geometry and partial differential equations. So rather than a direct topological attack, one uses deep results out of geometry and partial differential equations. And the beginning of this connection is the theorem from the 19th century, mid-19th century, due to Riemann, that all these topological manifolds have on them what we call a Riemannian metric. So these manifolds have tangent planes. So I've drawn, here's a manifold, it looks like a surface. A point on the surface, there's a linear space associated with the point, the tangent plane of the manifold. A Riemannian metric is simply a way to assign links and angles, like in Euclidean space, to the tangent planes, to every tangent plane uh, that varies smoothly as you move around the manifold, so-called Riemannian metric. Well, there's not just one Riemannian metric. There's an infinite dimensional family of Riemannian metrics on any manifold. Each Riemannian metric has associated with it curvature, which is really the part of the metric that's independent of the coordinates you use to write it down. When you write a metric down, you need local coordinates to write it. You choose different local coordinates, you'll get different formulas, but the curvature remains invariant as you change coordinates. So this is the part of the metric that's independent of the coordinates. And I've tried to indicate a little bit about curvature in dimension two, which is the simplest, the first dimension where there is curvature. And I've drawn three pieces of surface. This one has positive curvature, this one is flat, and this one has negative curvature. In two dimensions, curvature is, as Gauss uh, described it, a measure of the discrepancy of area from the area in the flat plane. So you look on your surface, take a point, take the ball of radius r on the surface, and you compare the area of that ball with the area of the ball of radius r on the plane. You take an appropriate limit as r goes to 0, and you get a curvature. It's actually got a sign reversal in it. If your area is smaller than the planar area, as it is in this case, that's positive curvature. Here the area is the same as the plane, so it's flat, and here the area is bigger. You know this has less area because anytime you take a top of an orange peel and you flatten it out, it rips because it doesn't have enough area to, to uh, cover the area on the plane. If you were to project this sort of saddle onto the plane, it would overlap on itself. It has more area. This one, you just slit it open, unravel it, and it flattens out onto the plane, so it has the same area. 
that's curvature in dimension two, Gaussian curvature. In higher dimensions, at every point and in every two-plane direction, there's a curvature called the sectional curvature, which is analogous to the curvatures we see here. And all these two-dimensional curvatures fit together into something called the Riemann curvature tensor. And as I say, that's the part of the metric that's invariant under coordinate changes. For example, Riemann proved that your, uh, if you have a Riemannian metric, you can find coordinates where it looks like the ordinary Euclidean metric, if locally at least, if and only if the Riemann curvature tensor is zero. Now, the nicest metrics are those of constant curvature, where all points, all two plane directions at all points have the same curvature. These are called metrics of constant curvature, and manifolds of constant curvature are well understood through the theory of Lie groups and so on. And in particular, the three sphere is the only simply connected three dimensional manifold with constant positive curvature. So this is, gives us a way to approach the Poincaré conjecture, start with a simply connected manifold, and try to find on it a metric of constant positive curvature. If you do, you will have produced, you will have proved that the manifold is the three sphere. And that's exactly what Perlman does. He starts with an arbitrary Riemannian metric on our simply connected three manifold, and he uses a partial differential equation to evolve that metric and shows that eventually it becomes round. Now, the equation that Perlman uses is an equation involving the curvature of the manifold. So you flow the metric. It's an evolution. It's a partial differential equation for an evolution of the metric. It was first introduced in mathematics by Richard Hamilton and in physics by Dan Friedan, where in fact it's a renormalization group flow. It's called the Ricci flow equation because it deforms the metric using the Ricci curvature tensor. And structurally as a differential equation, as a partial differential equation, it looks a lot like a nonlinear version of the heat equation, but not for scalar functions, but rather for these tensors, the Riemannian metric. And I've written the equation down. The metric here is gij in local coordinates. This is the Ricci tensor, which is, is, a tensor, is a curvature tensor derived from the Riemannian tensor by tracing on two of the four indices. And this is a parabolic evolution equation. It says the time variation of the metric is given by the curvature, the interesting minus sign. So the, the, because it looks a little bit like the heat equation for tensors, the Ricci flow has a dispersive quality to it. And I think the intuition should be that we have curvature all over the manifold, and this dispersive equation is going to equally distribute the curvature around the manifold. And in the case of a simply connected manifold, going to flow to curvature, constant positive curvature. And that's how we'll find this metric that we need in order to see our manifold is the three sphere. Well, this is an oversimplification of what actually happens. This is a nonlinear equation. And in, as in all nonlinear equations, one has to worry about the nonlinear terms forcing singularities, driving you to singularities. And in fact, that happens. This equation has finite time singularities doesn't always just flow nicely to the smooth, round metric. And in fact, the most delicate part of Perlman's argument is dealing with these finite time singularities where the curvature is blowing up. He was able to give a qualitative description of those regions, and using that, was able to show how to continue the topology and the geometry the topology and this flow equation through the singularities and keep the flow going until you converge to the round metrics at some later time. So this is exactly what he did. Um, his argument works as well not only for the three sphere, but 
for all three-dimensional manifolds and produces a description of every three-dimensional manifold in terms of geometric pieces. It does distribute the curvature evenly around the manifold, but different pieces will have different kinds of curvature. And it completely solves the question of what all three-dimensional spaces <coughs> look like. Most of them turn out to be the most interesting class turn out to be hyperbolic manifolds. These are manifolds of constant negative curvature, and these are exactly the three-dimensional manifolds that come up in Kleinian group theory, circling back to Poincaré's original work on Kleinian groups. So most three manifolds, the most interesting three manifolds are accounted for by these constant negative curvature manifolds, the Kleinian groups. Here we have the positive version of that in the three-sphere, and this geometric partial differential equation shows us how to find all these geometric structures starting with any Ramanian metric and therefore understand all three-dimensional manifolds. This is nothing at all like Poincaré's original presentation of the manifold. I haven't mentioned <coughs> Hagar decompositions or loops on surfaces or anything else. I've used geometry to solve this problem. There is now a very interesting new development in three-dimensional topology, which does go back to this point of view of the three-manifold as a Hagar decomposition and studying the loops that bound disks on the two sides and their patterns of intersection. We now have, thanks again to some partial differential equations, uh, we now have ways to study those intersection patterns that are that are stronger than just the purely topological methods that were available to Poincaré and the next hundred years of topologists. And it's not inconceivable that we might, in the end, be able to use these techniques to give an argument more like the one Poincaré originally had in mind. But that's what people thought for a hundred years, so maybe I'm just being overly optimistic. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Time for questions. Yes. No. The the different the differential equation exists in all dimensions, but it's much more powerful in dimension three than it is so far in any higher dimensions. And I think the fundamental reason is that dimension three is a dimension where Ramanian curvature and Ricci curvature are equivalent informations, equivalent information. In all higher dimensions, the Ramanian metric is a much more complicated, higher dimensional object than the Ricci. The Ricci curvature is just a shadow of a Ramanian metric. The flow equation is about the Ricci curvature. What you need to know about is Ramanian curvature. And this discrepancy makes the equation much less powerful in higher dimensions than it is in dimension three. There are higher dimensional results now using this equation, but they're in the complex Kähler case, where the metric is constrained quite a bit more than the general Romanian metric. And there are some positive results coming out of Ricci flow in that context. More questions? Yes, Claire. The handle body decomposition. I can't, sorry, I can't hear The question you. is how did he know about the handle body decomposition, Higgard splitting? Um, this came out of his, um, his study of Poincare duality. So he, his approach to manifolds was to triangulate them. And then he had the skeleton and the dual skeleton. And if you do this in dimension three, you have a neighborhood of the one skeleton, which is a solid handle body, and the dual, which is a neighborhood of the dual one skeleton. So there are your two solid handle bodies, and what's in between is just a product. So it was this picture of, of Poincaré duality. I mean, now we would say look at a Morse function, but that's not how he thought about it. He thought about it in terms of a triangulation. 
questions? I have the following question. You mentioned that you believe that Poincaré would have been surprised by Perelman's approach. Are you really convinced by that? <laughs> you know, I just want to say that uh, uh, one of the many proofs of Poincaré of the uniformization theorem is really using the somehow a version of the heat equation. Right. So he was very well aware of the fact that PDEs are fundamental in topology. But this is at least my, my point of view. Oh, well, let me, let me by uh, analogy say, yes, you may well be right. Um, when I talked to Bill Thurston about this, he said, I said, well, what do you think of this, Bill? He said, yeah, well, that's sort of how I thought it would go. <laughs> but I wasn't uh, the right person to try to do it, he went on to say. So... Okay, so if there is no more question, we thank you again.